Ahoy there, Captain Benzie here, coming at you with another ship fitting guide for Eve Echoes. Today we're going to be examining the Minmatar cruiser, the Rupture. We'll be having a look at the ship's stats, working out how to fit it, and then looking at it in combat. If there is a particular ship you would like to see featured in a future ship fitting guide, let me know in the comment section down below. Obviously, it does take a bit of time for me to find that ship, fit it in different ways to try out for the video, and then to actually record and upload, so thank you for your patience, but I would be interested to know which ships you want me to cover in future topics. Now, that said as well, if you do want to come join the Golden Horde out in Nullsec, carving out our own empire, you can still apply for the Catskull Cartel and the Catskull Collective, our sister corporation, by coming and joining us on the Discord shown on screen now. Make your application, come and make Eve Echoes history. Right, that all said and done, let's jump right into talking about the Rupture. Allow me to introduce the Rupture, the ship that I would see if you told me to close my eyes and imagine what a space pirate's galleon would look like. In fact, the curvature of the hull is very reminiscent of a galleon, especially here at the stern, where you have definite quarter galleries. The front even has its own little bowsprit, the kind of thing you might see a mermaid statue attached to on a 14th century galleon. I love it. I love this ship so much. This just looks like a crew of angry pirates drifting through space, and I adore that mentality. Anyway, enough about what the ship looks like, let's have a look at its fittings. So if we look at the fitting profile here, you can see that this ship has one, uh, one drone tube, which can launch either small or medium drones. It's got four high slots, two mid slots, and five low slots, which is the complete opposite of the Stabber Fleet issue. That has five high slots and four low slots, and we'll come back to that point in a moment. You've then got two power grid rigs, and we've got two mechanical rigs. Now, looking at the ship's defense, you can see here a whopping 12,587 basic. That's comprised of 3,969 on shields, 3,533 on armor, and 3,129 on structure. This is a tanky ship, and that's without any fittings or anything relevant to the ship itself, skill-wise, being trained here, and we'll come to that point in a moment. Now, the big point I'm getting at here when I mentioned about comparing this to the Stabber, uh, Stabber Fleet issue, which of course is the other Tech 6 Minmatar cruiser, is that swapping of the high and the low slots. The Stabber Fleet issue has five high slots, which allows it to fit more cannons and deal more damage, but only having four low slots means it does have to choose what it uses for tank, propulsion, weapon upgrades, that kind of thing. Whereas here, the Rupture only has four high slots, meaning it does pack somewhat less of a punch, about a 25% lower punch compared to the fleet issue, but it then has five low slots, and those five low slots make this an incredibly tanky ship, as we'll see later on. As you go down the rest of the stats here, you'll see a fairly middling capacitor with a, a, middle, to, a middle to fast flight velocity. For a cruiser, it's a Minmatar cruiser, so of course it is a little bit faster than others in its class, but it's still not particularly fast at all. That signature radius is quite interesting. It's not quite as big as you might expect for a ship of this size and this kind of tankiness. It is actually not the easiest cruiser to hit in the game, despite the fact that it is also incredibly tanky. You're not going to speed tank this anytime soon with a flight velocity of 288, but yeah, it actually is surprisingly hard to lock onto with the bigger ships, which is an important point later on in the game. Now, if we look at the trait descriptions here, you'll see that shield operation, which I do have trained, gives a 5% increase to the ship's shields. That's why, if you're looking at the attributes and fittings, the shield that you see there might be slightly higher for me than it is for you, because I have shield operation trained right the way up. But that 5% shield also is already cluing us in to what this ship is used for. The fact that it's getting shield bonuses should insinuate that, yeah, this is very much a tanky ship. Then for points in Cruiser Command, you will increase your medium capacitor tracking speed by 5% and reduce the activation time by 5% for each level. If you've got Cruiser Command at level 5, which I don't, then you would get 25% medium cannon tracking speed and a 25% reduction to medium cannon activation time, which means they fire faster and thus do more damage. Now, from this, you should be able to see that the Rupture, unlike the Fleet Issue Stabber, is not about dealing heavy damage. It's about survival. This ship is about getting into the middle of a fight and staying there for a long time whilst you rip everyone else into teeny tiny ribbons. So let's have a look at how I would fit this. Now, as I mentioned with all my cruiser videos, please bear in mind that I do not have any cruiser relevant skills trained. I don't have cruiser command here trained, so I'm not getting that medium cannon tracking speed or the activation time redu uh, reduction, which means the DPS here is lower than if you had those trained. I also don't have medium cannon operation or upgrade trained either. That would, of course, increase the DPS here too. I am basing this purely on a non-cruiser trained character. 
I also want to give a humongous shout out here to Shinrei, who has loaned me this rupture briefly for me to do this video. That's why I haven't got this rigged properly um, and I'm only running on fittings that I have available. Obviously, I can't afford to fully fit every single ship that comes my way. That's just not possible for me. But humongous shout out to Shinrei for loaning me this rupture. Anyway, so for the high slots, I've gone for a full complement here of Republic Fleet Medium Autocannons. The reason I've gone for Autocannons is because they are higher DPS, and I'm probably going to be up close and personal anyway, so I don't need to worry about the fact that these have a fairly short optimal range of only 2.4 kilometers, with an accuracy falloff of only 11.15. Okay, I say only, that's still actually fairly sizable. It's a cruiser. It's a cruiser, what do you expect? But the shorter range versions here, shorter range, higher DPS, I'm going to be in that kind of range anyway. I'm not worried about taking damage because this is a very tanky ship, so we may as well go for the short range, high damage variants, in this case, the autocannons. Now, because we're going into that close range combat, of course, it is best then for me to start fitting something like a medium energy Nosferatu. This is, I'm going to be up close and personal, so I can use this to drain my opponent's capacitor and refill mine, because this cruiser can get a little bit cap hungry sometimes with all of those tanking modules that you can see there at the corner if you're right at the bottom left. With all of those running, yes, I do need to find a way to keep my capacitor fueled, and you'll see that this is not a stable ship, but at 2 minutes 29 with everything switched on, it's not that bad. I never need to have everything switched on, and I can be using that Nosferatu to recharge whilst things are switched off, while the shield boost is switched off. Now, of course, as with any cruiser build, you 100% should aim to try and get one of those mid slots to contain a stasis weather fire of some sort. In this case, I've gone for an interruptive. Ultimately, that's because otherwise you are seriously going to struggle at hitting anything smaller than a cruiser. Destroyers and frigates are going to get up close and personal, they're going to whiz around you in orbit and you're just not going to be able to hit them. In this case, if something happens to get close, I can whack that web onto it, drop its flight speed by 57% and suddenly it becomes a much easier target to hit. Now, don't judge me, the mid-slot drone I've gone for here is a Mark V Infiltrator. I would normally go for a Mark V Valkyrie, I just didn't have one available. I'm not a huge fan of the Infiltrator, in fairness. I would prefer a Valkyrie on this build, because it allows me to lean into that explosive weapon damage. But, ultimately, I suppose it does help me cut shields that little bit faster using the, uh, the electromagnetic damage. Ultimately, what I would aim to do is have one of each. Get yourself a Mark V Infiltrator, and, and then the Galente and the Caldari ones, whose name evade me at this point in time, and a Valkyrie. It's a Wasp, I think, or a Vespa for the Caldari, and I think it's something, it's not the Hobgoblin, it's the other one. Golem? No, it's the middle one. I can never remember the Galente ones, because I don't really care about Galente. Sorry, Galente fanboys! <laughs> <laughs> so let's, I've just lost a load of subscribers, haven't I? Anyway, let's have a look at the low slots. Now, for this particular ship, obviously tanking is going to be a key, part, uh, key, key purpose of it, but I am going to still fit in a propulsion system. I am using short-range weapon systems, that means I need to be fairly close, and something like a smuggler medium afterburner will allow me to close that gap just a little bit faster so that I can actually stay in range with those weapons. I don't need this running all the time. I'm not speed tanking, this is just to get me up close and personal and into range with my guns. So, what about a micro warp drive? Definitely not. As I said, this ship is rather cap uh, capacitor heavy, it is rather capacitor hungry. If I put a micro warp drive on here, I reduce my capacitor down to 75% of its optimal size. That's a huge cost, one that I can't afford and I don't need that much speed. Afterburner is more than enough for what I need here. Now for the tank itself, I've gone for a Mark V medium shield booster. Straight up active tanking there allows me to repair any damage that my shields do take. Followed by a Gisty C-type adaptive invulnerability field. Yes, I was lucky enough to get my greasy mitts on one of these, and I'll come back to these in a moment, along with a Mark V reactive shield hardener. Now, some people have asked, what's the difference between a reactive and an adaptive? Well, an adaptive gives you a flat bonus across the board to all of the different resistances that you see on screen there. 36.49 across the board to all of those resistances. That is a really, really nice boost to resistance. It just means you're taking less damage. Whereas a reactive shield hardener, um, ultimately, every time you take a hit, the reactive shield hardener will adjust to what that hit was. So if you take a hit from explosive, it will start to increase its explosive resistance. If you then take a hit from electromagnetic, the explosive will start to come down and the electromagnetic will come up. This means that if you are up against opponents of a particular type, then a, a reactive shield hardener is a great way to help boost your resistance as combat proceeds. 
Ultimately, the more you get hit, the higher your resistances go. It does have to react to the damage coming in, and that's an important point to bear in mind. Now, as I've mentioned, this is not a capacitor-stable ship, and there are times where it's going to take a lot of damage and not be able to feed that back with the Nosferatu. This is where our Acolyth medium capacitor battery comes into effect. This I can activate for 25 seconds, it then has a 60 second cooldown, but for those 25 seconds, 1002 gigajoules of capacitor is dumped into my capacitor. That means that any systems I've got active are going to feed off that battery first and foremost, while my capacitor, my actual capacitor, recharges in the background. That is a very, very useful fitting. I actually had a conversation with some of the guys in Catskull last night, and they were saying, have you thought about putting one of those on? And I was like, do I really need it? I'd rather have something like a damage control. And they're like, no, no, no. Swap out for the capacitor battery. You're going to need it. Trust me. And sure enough, I jumped into a couple of, uh, couple of anomalies and encounters this morning and realized that, yes, I do need that in order in certain situations just to power up the capacitor. And what that gives us here is a standard DPS of 205.97, and we're always going to be in range to use that drone because of how the cannons work, and a cold defense of 1,000, sorry, 14,572 with these resistances here across the board cold. Now you'll see that the electromagnetic resistance is a little bit higher than you might expect here. That's because if we go into rigs, I have managed to pop in here an anti-electromagnetic screen reinforcer. I had one of these lying around. Um, that just ups the shield resistance by 30% for electromagnetic. Now I don't necessarily go up against a lot of electromagnetic, but it is plugging a hole in case someone who uses electromagnetic happens to turn up. Very useful if I'm going to a Mars base and going up against, say, Blood Raider or uh, Sancho Anomalies, because those are obviously using laser ships. The other one I've gone for here is a Cannon Burst Aerator. Now, a Cannon Burst Aerator isn't actually what I would recommend here. Again, it's just what I had lying around. If you're going to lean into anything on this one, because we've already got an activation time adjustment here, I would actually rig for straight up damage. A Collision Accelerator is going to be the better option there. The rule of thumb is that if a ship has statistics to, uh, to plus damage, then add in activation time reduction as the rigs. And if it's got activation time reduction as a passive, then put in a rig for the straight up damage. Rig for whichever one is the opposite, and it will usually give you a bigger DPS boost. Now, I am going to undock this because I want to showcase to you guys what happens once we hit combat and that defense starts changing with everything active and taking some damage. So let's undock and have a look at this thing in action. The only downside to using a ship like this, simply put, is how long it actually takes you to warp between systems and move to anomalies. I am so used to speedy little frigates, and I've been spoiled stupid with the Drumiel recently warping at 7.5 AU per second. But there we go, that's obviously the, the, the payout that you get for this being so damn tanky, is that it is that little bit slower. And again, oh, space pirates! <laughs> oh, I can't help it, let's go be bad guys. <laughs> big damn heroes that we are anyway so on we go into angel cartel hideout investigation this is a tier five or six i think it's a tier six mission we'll find out when we get into combat here oh it's a tier five one there we are so you can see this now in action so we'll move into the uh, into the uh, combat anomaly we're going to lock on as soon as this actually allows me to there we are we're going to orbit on the thrasher that's going to be our first one and as a cruiser you can see how long it does take here to get onto things Add on that stasis web of fire, add on all our damage, start doing what we can there, and let's activate all of the things we have here, all of our tank, and now have a look at the fittings. So you'll see now that the defense has shot up to 19474 with the resistances, lowest resistance is thermal now on 56%, and that will change as the battle goes on with me taking a little bit of damage from some of these as well. And you can see I'm taking almost nothing in return from these guys. Ultimately, I can just activate my shield booster and whoop, up it goes. Almost no capacitor being used for any of that either, and that thrasher is about to go down. Couple more hits is all that's going to take, one or two. A smaller target means it does take slightly less damage because I struggle to hit it even with the webs on it just because it's at four kilometers and it is trying to, to orbit me at a faster speed. As I've said, clearly that is always going to be the downside of using a cruiser. You need to be uh, like webbing targets like these in order to actually damage them properly. 
But again, there we are. You can see nothing here happening with the capacitor, really, or with the shields. And any small incidental damage that I take, I can just pop right back up there with the shield booster. Now, this is obviously just, you know, it, it, the shield booster does chow my capacitor a little bit as does the fact that I'm not really in range here. So let's orbit around now our stabber. That will change hopefully across the... There we are, there's the NOS active on that one as well. If I turn the shield booster off, the NOS will start to fill that back up. You can see I do a decent whack of damage to something like a stabber because it is a better sized target for me. As a cruiser, it's that little bit easier for my cannons to hit, although I've webbed it anyway just because I can. And we're sitting quite comfortably at full shields here because, yeah, it's a, it's a rupture. That, that's what a rupture does. It just sits at full shields. Now, if, it, if I decided that actually I am taking a bit too much to my capacitor, as I said, I can activate that battery. You see I've shot up to 127%, 125% now here. My natural ship's capacitor is recharging beneath that and will be uh, continuing to recharge whilst that battery there moves around towards the end of its duration. And when that duration ends, it will go on a cooldown period of 60 seconds. But we finished the first wave there. I can actually now make sure everything's turned off, which it is everything that's really important to be active. Next wave comes through. Let's focus on that burst, which being a smaller ship is going to take a little bit of time to lock onto. There we are. I'm getting a little bit of screen lag here. Not sure what's going on there. Orbit, activate everything, including the drones and the webs to slow that burst right down. There we go. And hopefully we can carve through that nice and quickly whilst it's still at a decent range. Being at range makes it easier to hit because transverse velocity is lower. I've said this before, but imagine you're looking out of your car window at, or a bus window or a train window as you're commuting to work or school or whatever it is you do. If you have a look out the window, things that are moving the opposite direction, so the other lane of traffic, seem to whiz by a lot faster than things in the distance. The things in the distance um, ultimately move slower. That's transverse velocity explained in a very, very basic nutshell. Um, and of course, it, it's like if you're... If you're aiming out of that car window and trying to hit a tree that's a mile away, the tree barely seems to move, whereas the trees on the side of the road are going to be zipping off at a much faster speed. Oh, new private chat message. Whoever that is, congratulations. You've made it into my video. I'm not going to open it on stream, though, um, just because some people do, uh, do sometimes say some quite unusual things, and I don't want to embarrass anyone. <laughs> But there we are, that's taking the Gist and Stabber down slowly and but surely. I do actually need to orbit that, that's the problem I've got here. I'm talking too much, not focusing on the combat, um, which means I'm actually outranging my guns, which is not a good look, really. And I need to turn that shield booster off as well, because I am training my capacitor. Focus, Benzie, focus! Anyway, there we go. So I'm now going to pull that Stabber down a lot better, as I'm now in the correct range to actually be shooting at it. Rupture doing its fang, taking, the, uh, taking all those little hits from the Stabber, and uh, just glancing them off my shields. Not a problem at all. No shield booster active here. Let's have a look at what those, uh, what that uh, defense is now sitting at. There we are, just, oh, oh, you can see there the explosive resistance has gone up. The electromagnetic has come down that little bit. Um, that is the reactive shield hardener at work there. So you can see that in effect quite clearly there. That means I'm taking even less damage from these particular ships. Now, as this is gonna take a while, I think I've proven my point. I'm not going to sit here and make you guys watch through this entire anomaly because that's just going to get dull as dishwater very, very quickly. So let's move on. Now, the question that actually inspired this video was which of the Tech 6 cruisers should I upgrade to as a Minmatar pilot? Should I go for the Stabber Fleet issue or for the Rupture? Now, hopefully the demonstration of the Rupture should have already given you an idea of if it's the ship that you want to go for or not. But just to look at that question a little bit more directly, let's actually have a quick glance across at the Stabber Fleet issue. Now, like I mentioned, the fitting profile here is reversed with the high and low slots in reference to the Rupture, whereas the Rupture has four highs and five lows, the Stabber Fleet issue has five highs and four lows. That means already you've got a straight up DPS increase for the Stabber Fleet issue. Putting all skills and things aside, five cannons compared to four is a 25% DPS increase on its own. Then you add in the skills and extra bits on the side here, which as you can see with the Stabber Fleet issue, is extra damage compared to the Rupture. It is just flat out 
going to have a higher DPS with the Stabber Fleet issue. That's what the ship is designed to do. It is a damage ship. Whether you fit on a load of strike cannons and then put on some tracking computers and gyro stabilizers to allow you to do absolutely insane alpha damage from a range further than you can see, then the Stabber Fleet issue is going to be the one for you. If you want to be in fleet, either PvE or PvP, and be the one actually hitting ships for maximum damage, then the fleet issue is by far the option you want to go for. If you're looking to solo encounters, however, you may find that the rupture is a little bit better for you. That's not to say that the Stabber Fleet issue is terrible at that. It's not. The Stabber Fleet issue is fantastic at cosmic anomalies. Just, you need to go for range because it gets a little bit squishy up close and personal. Whereas the rupture, as you've seen, is all about brawling. It's all about getting up close and personal and just surviving everything that's thrown at it. Now, whether you're doing that in PvE, in like a ratting fleet doing dead spaces, inquisitors, that kind of thing, or whether you're in a PvP fleet and trying to take the hits at the front as you get up close and personal, is kind of up to you. But if you want to be the tank of the party, the rupture is definitely the way to go. And as you start going up the tech levels, you'll see that that becomes something that the rupture starts to lean into more and more. Once we all hit tech level 7 in just under a month's time, the Rupture Guardian suddenly becomes an option. And if you've watched my video on the difference between the Thrasher Fleet issue and the Thrasher Guardian, then you'll have an idea of what this is all about. We lose another high slot, go down to three high slots, but instead of that, we now have the ability to equip a maximum, sorry, a shield field module. This can take a medium shield field module, which suddenly makes it great at protecting an entire fleet of ships from incoming damage. Go watch that uh, video I've just mentioned. I'll put a link up on the screen now talking about what shield field modules are and how they work. And you'll see that the whole point of the Rupture Guardian is simply to take damage for everyone else. You don't worry really about fitting big powerful guns. You do get a couple of bonuses here to the gun's damage just to help you uh, do that kind of thing. But most of what this is doing is about taking shield, uh, taking hits to your shield and keeping your teammates alive. And that then continues when we eventually hit tech level eight, which seems like so far away right now with the Rupture 2 Guardian. Same thing, an extra low slot and extra high, uh, extra high statistics here. The, 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 this actually can pack quite a wallop, whilst with those six low slots just taking nothing back. That's the tank. Obviously, once you hit tech level 8, the alternative one that we have then becomes the Stabber Sniper, which, like the argument between a Stabber Fleet issue and a Rupture, um, comes down to whether or not you want to be the tank or the DPS, because the Stabber Sniper can sit at insanely long ranges. I think, if my calculations are right, you can hit nearly 300 kilometers with a Stabber Sniper if you fit it properly with strike cannons um, and the right uh, targeting computers and go into sniper mode. It's insane. It's absolutely insane. You can hit them, they don't even know you're there. <laughs> <laughs> but then, of course, the Rupture Guardian is going to be designed for more of that fleet combat. Um, don't sit there and ask. I get a lot of people asking, should I use a Guardian ship um, to tank solo? It doesn't work like that. Ultimately, the point is that you're going to be taking that damage to you anyway. The point of the shield field module is to stop that damage being spread out across multiple targets. It, all that damage gets absorbed onto one ship, so a logistics ship is much easier, has a much easier time just keeping one ship alive rather than trying to keep a fleet of 10. And that just about wraps up everything that there is to say about the Rupture, I feel. This is one of my favourite cruisers. If I weren't so enamoured with frigates and I was actually training into cruiser skills, then a Rupture would probably be what I'm flying until I can get into a Hurricane. I adore the look of this ship. I love what it does. I love its playstyle. That brawling up close and personal playstyle, as you've probably seen from me speed tanking in frigates, is what I enjoy in EVE. So, yeah, the Rupture really does fit that quite well. It's a fantastic ship. Fairly expensive on the market right now, but in the right hands can be an absolute beast of a ship that just isn't going anywhere soon. It is a rock. And hopefully that's given you some inspiration. Hopefully if you are trying to work out whether or not you want to fly a rupture or something else, this may have swayed you toward the rupture. And if it does, good luck in it. I love this ship. Let me know how you get on with it. Send me some screenshots on Twitter with the hashtag CSKL. I love checking through you guys' screenshots and seeing what you're all doing. I love hearing your stories. So please come join us on the Catskill Cartel Discord as well. And if you do, as I said, want to help us carve out an empire in Nullsec, you can come apply for the Catskull Cartel and the Catskull uh, Collective, our sister corp there as well. Applications are open. We're looking for more of you to come join us and have some fun. Anyway, folks, thank you for watching right the way to the end. Happy sailing and see you in New Eden.